In Luke's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Luke's Gospel, the sixth chapter. You look beautiful today. Look at the one next to you and say, he just said, I look beautiful. I don't know about you. <laughs> now, I tell them they're beautiful too. Amen. We're so fortunate to have you here today. God bless you for coming. Amen. There's a lot of places you passed to get here, but you chose to come here. And I thank you, and I don't take that lightly. Luke, the sixth chapter, and verse number 38. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. There's power in your giving. Because he said, if you give, that giving shall give unto you. Now, the world can't understand that. He said, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall give unto you. That men in there is added. That ain't supposed to be even in there. It's in your strong concordance numbers is 9999. So to be read right, it's not man that's going to give to you. Your giving will give to you. That's what he's talking about. He says, not only to give to you, but to give good measure and then press down, push down, pack down, and then shake it together. You ever put something in and shake it together and shake it down? And then running over your giving will give unto you, unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The same measure, the same measurement that you measure out, only when it comes back to you, it'll be good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over when it comes back to you. So if you're going to give a thimble, don't get a bushel basket to hold it. But... When he takes and packs it down, shakes it together and runs it over, he'd probably fill that bushel basket up. Amen. Because that's just the way God is. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning, most of all, for who you are. Father, teach us, Lord, the power of giving. To understand, Lord, uh, Father, that giving is a nature of you, Father. Lord, it's a fruit of you. And Father, it's a part of you. For you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten Son. And Father, teach us, Lord, the power of giving. How, Lord, that giving comes back to us, but it comes back to us blessed. And Father, we just love you, honor, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The title of what we're talking about this morning are givers and takers. In this world, there's a lot of givers, but there's more takers than there are givers. Amen. If you're a giver this morning, you're blessed. You're blessed with much because most always a giver is industrialist. They're doers. They're workers. Amen. They understand the value of things and God blesses them. On the other hand, takers usually are in poverty. If you think about it, takers are in poverty. They have a welfare mentality. They're usually lazy. They want someone else to do it for them and give it to them. That's where this smash and grab society has come that we're seeing all over the land that they a group of them would just go into stores and smash and grab all that they're cause they're takers. They're not givers. They're selfish. They're too lazy to work. They want to take what you have. But God cannot bless that. That's why they're cursed. That's why their life is a mess and they can't see it. They think they're getting ahead, but their life is a mess because they never learned the power of giving. Amen? Paul Harvey made a commentary one time years ago. I used to like listening to him if I could ever catch him on. You know, he had some, a lot of wisdom in what he would say, but he told a story, a true story. He said there was this, the government got this one lady who had a, had a house full of kids, no man. You know, it's probably a man for each one of them kids somewhere, but nevertheless, 
Make an example, so they bought this, built this brand new house and put brand new furniture in it and they moved this family into this home. You gotta understand they're takers, they're not givers. They don't understand the value of things and, and so they put them in, there, in this home to make an example of how to try to make them better. And a year passed and she called them up and says, I need somewhere to live. And they said, what are you talking about? And they went over to the house and the doors was tore, torn off the, the hinges. There was holes all in the walls uh, and the house was in shambles because they're takers and not givers. Right. Understand the difference. That's what we're talking about this morning. That's what Jesus is talking about and trying to teach us. And, and I, I'm looking at a bunch of givers today and you say, well, why in the world that you're preaching this to us? Because we're givers, we're hard workers. But God wants us to understand, understand not to take what you have, God has blessed you with because you're givers and sow it and give it to dogs. Amen, understand that. Understand the difference between a giver and a taker. There's not many givers that the church has had to help throughout the years. Tithers I'm talking about. I could probably count on my fingers on my hand or even on one hand the time that we've had to help, help them. Had to. Sometimes we help just to, just to help people do a good deed, you know, but, but not that they needed it. But on the other hand, I've had plenty of opportunities to help takers. Are you with me? We're going somewhere with this. Proverbs eleven twenty four. he says, There is that that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Understand the power of giving. To giving. It doesn't make sense here, but that word right there says, There is that that scattereth or gives, and yet it increaseth. Because we're giving what God and giving it by God. Amen. And remember what God said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. When we sow into things and give, my friend, it's going to come back to us blessed. And then on the other hand, it says there is that that withholdeth more than is, than is meat and it tend to poverty. And there's, there's those that will not give their takers. They will not understand the power of giving and they live in poverty their whole life waiting for someone else to give to them. Takers, if it inconveniences them any, they're not gonna do it. On the other hand, givers, it does not matter the cost to them or how inconvenienced they are. A giver will still do, amen. Are y'all with me? I hope I'm talking about us all here this morning, right? Uh, I ain't getting many amen, so I hope you're not takers. I hope I ain't looking at a bunch of takers here today. You ought to feel good about yourself, amen, if you're a giver because you're blessed by God. Givers, show favor and kindness. Givers restores. Givers make an impact to the good in life and society. Amen? The man in the Bible that fell among thieves, you know the story, that fell among thieves and the priest came along and he looked at him and he, and he just kind of passed by. And the Levi came along and he passed on the other side of the road. He saw him, but they was both takers. The priest and the Levi were takers. They didn't want to be inconvenienced. But the Bible said another man came along and they called him the good Samaritan. The Samaritan came along and he got him out of the ditch. Amen. He was a giver. And he got him out of the ditch and he carried him and he healed, put ointment on him and he took care of him and carried him, put him up in a, in a room somewhere and told the man, gave him money, said if you need more, when I get back, I'll pay you. He was a giver. That man was blessed and God looked at that Samaritan as the one in the story that was most like him because he was a giver, not a taker. Amen? The world has very few givers and a whole lot of takers. America at one time years ago, there was more givers than takers. And America was blessed, but America today is going bankrupt because there's so many takers. Selfish. 
on their own. We see it in the world. And if we're not watchful, it'll come into the church world. And we don't even know that we become takers and not givers. It just kind of suddenly comes in on us. If you come back tonight, which I know, well, I hope I'm wrong. But if I go by past experiences, I won't see many of you tonight. But if you come back tonight, you'll hear a little bit more, kind of a continuation of this about the church. But there's a story, and I'll mention it again tonight. It's a true story. In my hometown, when my dad pastored, there's a lady in the church, if I'm not mistaken, it was a, I'm not sure who it was, but anyhow, the doctors told her, there's no hope, we're going to send you home to die. My dad called the church a fast. Didn't know how long the fast would be, just fast and pray, be fasting and praying, fasting and praying. One Sunday night, the Lord spoke to my dad when he got up to preach, he said, now's the time. He said, y'all get up, gather your stuff and get in your cars and follow me. And the whole church went over that woman's house and they went in and she's laying on the bed expecting death to take her. And the church was givers and they came and they gave to that woman what she needed. They prayed for her. Amen. After sacrificing and, 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 and seeking God. Amen. Uh, my dad said when they left, Going home, the woman was holding the screen door open, waving by at him. I'm telling you, the church was givers back then. But you see what happened, modern conveniences started coming into the church. Amen. And the phones came in, and rather than go and visit the sick and carry them something to eat, we pick up the phone and started calling them and said, how you doing today? Amen. The phone has become our legs. Uh, and we started to doing that. Uh, and the church is starting to get lazy and begin to become takers gradually. And then the tech world comes in. Uh, and we know of someone that's in need. Uh, and maybe somebody says, Look, please remember me in prayer. I'm awful sick. Uh, and all we do is hit like on Facebook. Uh, come on now. And half the time don't even pray for them. Because we become takers and not givers. Uh, the church needs to get back to being givers uh, and not takers. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Give and it shall be your giving will be given to you. Is what he's saying. Are you with me this morning? I said, are you with me this morning? You see that concept of giving and it shall be given to you. Give and it shall be given unto you is the same concept of sowing and reaping. Seed time and harvest was in Genesis and it's always been. And for a farmer to ever receive anything, he's first got to give seed to the ground for the ground to give him the crop. Is that not right, Brother Woody? As Brother Woody, was, wife and I was out in the country riding the other day and I saw cornfields. And, and some of them was real grown, but some, the corn was about this tall, the whole field. Same height. But throughout, sporadically through that field, it was probably 30 or 40 stalks individually by itself stood that much higher than all the rest. And so I was kind of, I said, I wonder why that is. Same dirt, same everything. It seemed like the same everything, but, but they're much taller. And so I asked Brother Woody, today he had different, and we talked about it for a little while. Amen. He's a corn man. He knows corn. <laughs> of course, he said, he said, corn, you'll find how many ears on a stalk today. I told him, I said, I don't know. I thought it was about three, three ears to a stalk. He said, you get one. Every once in a while you see one with two. That's bad, isn't it? That sounds like the church. That sounds like the church is dwindling down. Are you with me? Oh, he's stepping on the toes this morning, Brother Whitfield. Oh, yeah. It's all right. I'm glad you can feel it. You ought to thank God you still feel. Amen. I told him, I said, maybe, I said, anytime I see things in nature, I put it spiritually to the Bible. I try to 
related somehow. I, I said maybe maybe it was something in that one seed that was planted that popped up greater. I said, I don't know. And then as I was talking, I said, maybe, maybe the whole field is like the world. And then there's a few that find it. <laughs> this stands above them all. Those are the Christians. Amen. Few out of all the crowd, you'll stand out. Amen. If you're a Christian. Are you with me? Paul said in Philippians 4 and 15, he says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. And even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again to my necessity. Remember, give it, it shall be given unto you. He says, not because I desire to give, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul said, I'm not glad that you sent it, that I received it, but I'm glad you gave because when you gave, your giving is going to bless you. It's to your account. He says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus the things which uh, were sent from you an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God, and because you gave, look what he said, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, so often we quote uh, uh, Philippians 4.19 uh, and we, we put it on our refrigerator, but my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, but we fail to realize uh, the reason Paul said that to the Philippian church is because they gave because they was givers and not takers only. Are you with me? He said in 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter verse 6, uh, he says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly, he which gives sparingly shall reap also sparingly. I told you a thimble or a cup full or a basket full, uh, you know, we measure our blessing by our giving. And he which soweth or, or gives bountifully shall also reap bountifully. He said, verse 7, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, uh, not grudgingly, not of necessity, not because Brother David is talking about giving today. Amen? If you notice, we've already received the offering. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a money type preacher. If you know me. Amen? Give if you want to. If you don't want to, that's your business. I don't care. Ain't no skin off my nose. That's why when we started this church almost 35 years ago, November 35 years ago, in fact, we moved into this building 31 years ago, the 25th of this month. What, what next, not, not tomorrow, but next Monday. It's my birthday. We moved into this on my 40th birthday. So y'all figured up, yeah, I'm seven, I'll be 71. <laughs> y'all, are they doing this? I tell people sometimes, Sister Con and I, we got married in September, and Tina's birthday is October, and they can start, I said, of the next year. <laughs> <laughs> they want to start. <laughs> Hello. He said, for God loveth a cheerful giver, somebody that from the love and compassion and the, of, of their heart gives. That's why I, I didn't finish the story, 35 years, and when we started in the little trailer down the road, I said, we'll receive an offering on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is the offering time. And from then to now is the only time we receive an offering unless it's a special singing or or, or, or a special speaker. I, I think y'all take up something back there. They ain't always done that in Sunday school. Y'all just started taking that up uh, several years ago to pay for the Sunday school literature that y'all use up. Amen? But listen to this. From day one, I've had preachers come through and they say, hi, in the world. I don't know how you do it. How you do it? I said, it's God. Amen? You don't need money. You need God. And one offering... On Sunday morning, no fundraisers, and when we moved in this place, it was paid for after 10 months. And 
preachers say, I don't know how you do it. I said, God. They take up 15 offerings. I remember I was in the storefront and I went to a singing over here at this little church across the tracks over here. And, and, and they took up an offering and, and he knew I was a preacher over at the, at the storefront. And, and he asked me to receive offering. I, I hate to get attention, you know, that, but I did, you know. And then he wanted me to go back there in the back and count it. And I said, oh, Lord, I, I don't want to get involved with this, you know. So we did come back and give it to the pastor. And before the same group got back up, he said, we didn't get enough in the offering. We, we need these brothers to come in and receive another offering. Oh, man, you could have just shot me. Amen. I'm like David. I've been young and now I'm old, never seen the righteous forsaken their seed begging bread. That's why I don't like to see people out there in front of Walmart with a cup for their church begging bread. Amen. Help me, Lord. He said, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward. He knows how to tilt things our way, don't he? All grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. They don't leave anything out, does it? May abound to every good work. Uh, He said, Proverbs 3 and 9, he said, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Uh, So shall thy barns be filled with what said plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. In other words, uh, a giver is going to be blessed with much. Amen. Amen. I remember when we first got saved. We got saved December. And I hadn't got my state tax refund back yet. He said, you get in touch with him? I said, no, nah, I didn't want to mess with it. It was a few hundred dollars, but you sure, I'm sure we could use the money. But, you know, I know if I try to stir up and try to track it down, then they'll say, well, we need to audit this guy. Just throw it out there. We need to audit this late in the year. We need somebody to audit. Let's audit him. And I, I didn't want to tie time. It's not that like I was hiding anything. I just didn't want to tie, be audited. Would you? I said, just forget it. And so we got saved in December. Brother Donna, we paid our tithe on Sunday. Monday, I went to the mailbox. You know what was in there? That state check. You said, well, Brother Whitfield, ain't no way it could have got there that quick. Mail service ain't that fast. That thing could have been laying in there the whole time. I just ain't seen it till God uncovered it. I don't know, but I know it was in there. I remember when I was a little boy, my dad passed in St. Mary's, Georgia. I was sitting on the front pew right here. I'd worked in a little old store out there, uh, piddling around out there, and I'd made me a, a couple of dollars, you know, and uh, I think I had a dollar left in my pocket, and offering came by, and I just felt a little voice. I, I think I was in the fifth grade. Uh, a little voice said, put that dollar in, boy. I threw that dollar in that offering plate. Uh, amen. Uh, and the next day I was out in the backyard. You got to understand behind the church was just woods. Uh, there wasn't nothing out there in the backyard, just woods. Uh, and I went out there playing uh, and I looked over and I seen something on the ground. I went over there and it was a dollar bill. Amen. I, I went running in the house. Mama, look what I found. Look what I found. Uh, what's the next thing you do after you find money? Look for more. All right. I see I'm among friends today. Amen. I went back out there looking, I looked, and I found another one. And I looked a little more, found another one. And I looked a more, found another one. Fourfold. Amen. I'm telling you, God taught me at a young age. You can't out give me, boy. Show me. Give me something to bless, and I'll bless you. Amen. How many believe that? Somebody said, Why are you so blessed? Say, I'm a tither. Because I'm a t- I'm a giver. Help us, Lord. I remember when I first got saved. I know I'm rambling. First got saved, I'd load my old lawnmower up and go over and cut grass because nobody else was cutting it. Don't nobody ask me. I just seen it need to be done. I'd load my old lawnmower up on a Toyota truck. I'd strain and lift it all. I had a 42-inch cut riding on more. I'd pick that thing up on the front and get up there and pick the whole back end up and slide in that truck, you know. That's back when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> Go cut that grass, hey amen. Let me tell you, it seemed like my grass didn't need cutting as much. 
I don't know. It stayed green, but I didn't have to cut it as much. It's amazing, isn't it? I got to hurry. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. God's good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Y'all remember the widow's barrel? Y'all know the story, don't you? The widow's barrel. She had a handful of meal out gathering sticks. Uh, man of God said, what you doing? I'm gathering some sticks. Uh, I got a, a little handful of oil, a little, little oil in, uh, in the cruise. Uh, I'm going to cook it. Me and boys going to eat. Now, nah, he said, just bring me a little bit first. Tithe off of that. Give of your need. And so she did. She brought it to the man of God. Y'all know the story. She goes back and looks over there, and there's another handful of meal in there. Her and her son eat again, you know. They get up next morning, and go by and look in there, and there's another handful. And mama said, oh, boy, son, we can make us another pound. He said, well, let's make the man of God one first. Amen. It carried him one. Come back another handful in there. Kept going, kept going, kept going. Uh, let me tell you, uh, it fed them and, and they gave of their meal and they got meal. Uh, but let me tell you, when you give, it doesn't also always necessarily mean you're going to get back what you give. It's pressed down, shaken together and running over. Her son died. And what happened? Because she fed the man of God, kept him around. You feed him, you'll keep him around. Amen. And, and, and what happened? He died and the man of God went and brought him back to life and gave the woman back her son. I'm telling you, it, it has benefits out of this world. When we learn to give the power of giving, I'm telling you, you can't outdo giving. Your giving will bless you. Awesome is our God. Aren't you glad of that? You got to sow to the right place. Now, if I was a farmer and I went out there and there was some old crusty looking soil there and didn't look at fit for nothing. Said, well, I'm going to sow into that and see if I get a harvest. I doubt you're going to get anything. Right, Brother Woody? You ain't going to get too much out of that. And that's the problem. People sowing in the wrong places. That's like these televangelists. And they say, if y'all don't send me money, we're going to have to go off the air. I'm like Jesse Duplantis. Don't send it. Let them go off. It'll free up more time for me. Amen. And I preach the gospel. Would you put money in a sinking ship? No. So in the good ground. Put your money in good ground. Put your efforts. Uh, when, you, when you're talking about tithing, it's not about all just money. You tithe your time. Uh, amen. You tithe your love. You tithe your giving. You tithe your, your, your compassion and everything. Every part of you is part of God. Amen. We understand that. He said, Haggai, he said in verse number five of the first chapter, he says, now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I ask you this morning, are you a giver or a taker? Let me ask you that. Are you a giver or a taker? Where are you giving to? Maybe you're a giver this morning, but it's not paying off. Are you giving to the right thing? Amen. In fact, in Haggai, he said, he that soweth to the wind shall reap a whirlwind. I mean, you can't just throw it out there. And go, well, I'm going to give. I'm just giving money away. I'm giving my, my time away. Give my time to all these, these things here. And it's just spinning wheels, doing nothing. You're sowing to the wind. Farmers don't sow to the wind. They don't take seed and just go out there and wind blow and let it fall where it may. No, they prepare the soil. The sower in Luke the eighth chapter talks about sowing in good ground, does he not? We got to sow in the right place. That's what he's talking about. He said, consider your ways. He said, you have sown much and you bring in a little. He said, Brother David, I give, I give, I give, and it don't work. Well, where are you sowing? What, what are you spending your time in? Is it where God would have you? He said, you eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages, uh, and put it in a bag with holes. Uh, he said, consider your ways. You got to understand when it comes to God, God gives us wisdom of what to do with the blessing he's blessed us with. Amen. Take you out one and nine and said, you look for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, because you wasn't industrious, you didn't take care of what God blessed you with. That's why he says, consider the ant. They're very industrious, hardworking. They take care of what they're their own. They take care of the, amen? He said, consider the ant. 
The woman I told you the story, Paul Harvey, she didn't take care of what was given her. It says, you brought home, I did blow upon it. Why? Why did it blow upon it? He said, because of my house that is waste. See, so often people spend all their time and they're going and doing and they got to do, they got to work seven days a week to obtain all this stuff and, and the house of God sacrificing and suffering for it. I go by and I almost want to throw up when I go by classrooms that, that Sister Vanessa and Sister Bonnie studies all week for and prepares and has things for them little children and moms and dads are too sorry. That's why I said it, sorry, to bring their children to that class. Amen and learn about Christ because they're so give out because of all the they got to get that almighty dollar God said because my house is lying waste you want your house blessed bless my house that's what he said brother with me I ain't coming back here no more you're a hard preacher well go over there with them old candy cotton preachers Listen, I was preaching when most of you came and I'll be preaching when you leave. Amen. 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 Man didn't call me. I've had to get up and walk out shaking their head and close the door behind them. Didn't like what I was saying, but let me tell you, I don't work for them. I work for God. He's my boss. I don't just open this book and say any, many, mighty, mo. what do you want us to know? I see God and I hear the voice of God and he tells me what the church needs to hear. Help us, Lord. Did not Cain get in trouble with God? He just bought anything. He yeah, this be all right. This is, here, Lord. But Abel went out there and brought his very best he had. I don't care if the very best that you have is that. God is more pleased than if that is not your best there the whole thing is not your best and you bring that understand what are we presenting to the Lord what are we showing our children you know these parents have got children that kind of hit and miss church and then they, they raise them up and say oh I hope they, they turn out to be Christians in church well if you've not trained them they won't be the Bible said train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he would not depart from that. Let me tell you, I was trained up. My mom and dad was in church and I brought up, I slept a many a night on church pews coming up. Many of you did too. Amen. He says, Malachi, he says, will a man rob God those coming instruments. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee, Lord? He said, in tithing and offerings. Now remember I said a while ago, your tithing is just not money. You know, so often preachers get that all messed up and money's got a bad taste even in my mouth in church because there's so many hirelings out there want money. My wife, you know, for a, I worked at aluminum plant out there in Goose Creek for for uh, eleven years. Even while I was building this building here, visiting hospitals and getting up three messages a week, visiting the sick, doing funerals, and working and working and. Some, maybe some of you was working here too. I didn't draw a salary. I would rather it, the money go to this. I was getting paid decent out there at the aluminum plant. I was fine. 
when I left the Luna plant in 1998, I told the church, I said, um, I feel like the Lord wants me to go full time because the church had grown. I'm trying to keep all this and do that. And, and I said, I don't think God would want me to take a pay cut to go from the aluminum plant here. And so everyone agreed, and I told them what I was making. And I remember Brother Jerry Todd saying, well, I figured you were making more than that. And I said, no, I'm fine with that. And uh, I hadn't taken a pay rate raised since 1998 from the church. Connie asked me the other day, said, have you gotten a raise in a while? I said, I ain't taken a raise since 1998 when I went full time. But I'm a giver and I'm blessed. Amen? I'm blessed. I'd not even ask you for a raise. Amen? Have a? He says, in tithing and offering, it's your time. And what do you, what do you give to the Lord? I mean, money is easy. I mean, if somebody, if somebody dies and it's easy just to send money for Sister Vanessa to go get some chicken and carry it to them. But for us to go in there and actually prepare it ourselves, fix something and, and then carry it to them, you don't get many of that, do you, Sister Vanessa, anymore? You used to. I know I'm meddling. Maybe to help us. I don't know. But verse 9 says, You're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He said, Bring ye some of the tithe. And Oh, no, wait a minute. That's it all. Didn't it? All the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. In other words, read it backwards. If you're not bringing all your tithe into the storehouse, the windows are closed. There not be room enough to receive it then he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I asked the Lord one time, I said, I said, Lord, what? I don't have no crops in the field. What? Uh, rebuke the devourer, what is that? And he spoke back to me and he said, son, he said, interest is a devourer that's destroying my people. I always said if I was in the church of God, I said, when they training their pastors up, they need to send them to a financial school or something other. No finances. They get to church with so much debt, so much interest. Strap poor people down, and then when they do, they go on to another church and do the same thing. It's crazy. I've, I've heard horror stories. Interest. Let me tell you, if you lock down with a bunch of interest, you know what interest is? It's taking your money and sticking a match to it and burning it. You get nothing for it. I asked young people sometimes, I said, I said, uh, how much does that cost you? So, well, it's only $500 a month. I said, no, no, how, how much does it cost you? $500 a month. I said, no, what's the whole picture? And we sat down with them and show them on paper, and they said, oh, God, I didn't know I was paying that for that. He said, I'll rebuke the devourer. That's why we moved in this building. It was debt free. Everything you see is debt free. Amen. My house is debt free. Many of yours is. Why? Because you've been coming here a while and you've learned how to not let interest destroy you. Are you with me? Well, brother, well, I can't afford, my payments are so much, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to. Understand me, this is God's word. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy your fruit. What, verse 12, he said, all nations shall call you, what? Blessed. 
For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Why? Because it's the power of giving. God understood that when he says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son. But look at here, how many sons has he got return? He gave one son, but look how many sons he got. The power of giving. And it works the same way in mine and your life. Hallelujah. That's why he said again uh, in closing in Luke the 6th chapter verse 38. Uh, he said give. And it's like a law of God. When you give, your giving is going to give unto you. Uh, it's your giving that gives unto you. I know man is in there. And it says men shall give unto my men is added in, ten, in there by, by man. Uh, amen. It shouldn't even be there. Uh, he said give uh, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Amen. That's like Psalms 23. My cup runneth over. He said, shall give unto your bosom. Your giving shall give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. Stand to your feet.